Okay, in, uh, in this video, we are going to continue talking about uh, evaluating performance of uh, classification, binary classification. And in particular, what I'm going to focus now is uh, the concept of gains, gains and lift. I want you to imagine the following uh, setup. Suppose you work for a direct mail, uh, for direct marketing uh, company, and you want to send out a, some type of offer, and you want to capture responders to your offer. So there's the population out there, potentially very large, and you want to send a certain offer, let's say, to buy your product. I mean, some people call it junk mail, uh, but it doesn't matter. So you're just sending that offer, and you're looking for responders to your offer. Now, of course, in the ideal world, uh, you would like everyone to respond, but the truth of the matter is that in reality, what usually happens, you will have, uh, say, 1% of responders out there. So if you target 10,000 people, you'll only expect to have 100 people, and so on and so forth. So there is the population out there, there is that responders group out there that it could be pretty small, and to make uh, things even more complicated, you cannot really send that offer to everyone in the population because you'll be wasting a lot of money and a lot of resources. So you have those two challenging constraints. You know there are responders out there and you want to address them all. And then you also have limited resources and you want, you, you can only afford mailing that offer to let's say 10 or 20 percent of the population. So therefore there is this problem arises where you need to identify the potential targeted group or if you want to mail that offer to 20 percent of the population then you want to identify the right 20 percent of the population. Ideally you want to have uh, many more responders among that targeted group than uh, you would expect in general as the baseline. And that's a very important setup. It arises in practice all the time. As I said, the whole direct marketing uh, business revolves around this, but the, the same problem can arise in any different situations. So suppose you want to do that and, uh, well, at the very least, you could always pick that uh, potential uh, responding segment at random. So I could simply uh, make uh, a set of a sequence of random draws and I could say, okay, I'm going to target 20% of my population at random. The problem is that if I only have 1% of responders out there and if I do random marketing, then targeting 20% of the population, I only expect to target about 20% of the actual responders. So there is uh, potentially 10,000 responders out there by targeting 20% of the population at random, I will only get, I expect to have only 2,000 responders in the group. And this is where the predictive modeling comes in because you want to collect a sample and you want to understand what or model what people are more likely to respond. So you get that sample, you build a model, and uh, the model scores everyone, so it assigns some kind of continuous score to every uh, observation, to every example out there. And now you want to use these scores to identify the group that are going to target. So the assumption is that if you have a good model, then uh, uh, people that got higher score are more likely to respond. I mean, after all, that's why you're building uh, a binary classification model in the first place. And therefore, when you identify the potential targeted group, you're going to pick up uh, the people who were scored the highest. And that's the essential underlying framework for the introduction of the concept of gains and lift. So now let's see how it all can be expressed in some kind of analytical form. And again, so I'm starting with uh, uh, this setup that we had before. And uh, this time, again, let's look at this uh, uh, kind of uh, mock-up data set here. These are my observed responses. Uh, this is uh, the score that my model assigns 
to every record. And uh, at this point, it doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, the, the white hat will be uh, projected positive when my score is above a certain threshold, and otherwise it will be negative. And so suppose in, uh, uh, I mean, what, what I want to do now is uh, I take my data set, I sample it. Uh, so I have my data sample. So then I build a predictive model, then I apply that model to the data set, and I get the set of scores, this H. Then I take these uh, records and I sort them descendingly, such that here on top I get the maximum score, and at the bottom I get the minimum score. And if my model works as expected, in other words, uh, the records that get higher score also associated with uh, actual observed responders, then what I expect to happen is that near the top of the data set I'll have mostly responders, and then near the bottom of the data set I'll have mostly non-responders. And of course, the better my model is, the higher the level of separation of responders from non-responders. Again, I took the data set, I applied predictive model to that data set binary classification, and I sorted by predicted score. So now I want to see the performance of this situation in terms of the direct marketing campaign. So what I'm going to do next is uh, I'm going to pick uh, starting from the top, a number of records that correspond to 20%. So let's say if I have uh, 1 through n, so if I have uh, 10,000 observations in the data set, I'm going to pick uh, 200 observations in the top. These are the observations that have the highest scores. And now let's recall what, what the concepts that we introduced before, the sensitivity or recall, was defined as uh, the number of true positives divided by the sum of true positives and false negatives. So if you re remember this table here, these are my true positives, false positives, false negatives, true negatives. So what the sensitivity is doing here, it's taking true positives as the fraction of uh, the total number of positives out there in the data set or in the population. And again, these are my positives, negatives, positives, negatives. So same convention as before. So my sensitivity becomes the percentage of the class of interest that is captured in this upper part. So I would could say here, in other words, I can plot uh, on this uh, graph here uh, set the following coordinates. So I could say, all right, so I'm targeting 20% of the population, and this horizontal axis will be uh, indicated by the term support. And support in this case is defined simply as percent population that's being targeted. Again, if this is my predicted pluses, then the percent population targeted is simply this part divided by total number of records. So this is essentially how many, what is the fraction of population that I'm going to target in this case. And now suppose that when I took 20% of the population here, and this part, my actual sensitivity happens to be 40%. So by targeting 20% of the population, I actually managed to get 40% sensitivity. So I can take this point and plot it here. And again, what I have done here, I scored my sample data according to my predictive model, and then I took the 20% of highest scores. And then what I observed is that among that 20% of highest scores, I actually captured 40% of the group of interest. So that's why I'm plotting sensitivity or recall versus support.
And that becomes a point on the gains curve. Now you can imagine that you could have taken 10% of the population and see how, what, is, what the sensitivity would have been there. You can also model 50%, 70%, etc. So if you model all of those individual configurations, uh, the end result will be points that can be plotted as a curve that looks like this. So it starts at a zero, it always ends at one, here and here. So the plot of sensitivity versus support is called gains curve. And yeah, so this is our gains curve. And what is more interesting, at this point, you basically identified that, let's say, at this point on the gains curve, for 20% of the population, you're getting 40% of uh, the responding group, re responding group. Now, on the other hand, if you were to mail these things at random, you would have expected that if you randomly mailed 20% of the population, you would only expect to get about 20% of the responding group. And likewise, if you mailed 50% of the population, you would expect it to have only uh, something like here, 50% of the responding group. And if you kind of look at it from uh, uh, study it again and think about it a little bit more, what you'll realize is that in the worst case scenario, when you are sending offers or picking people at random, the, the gains curve will have this 45 degree line. So this is a kind of the worst case scenario that corresponds to random sampling. And this is the gains curve that comes from the model that you have at hand. So now uh, let's consider the next interesting question. So at this point it should be clear what the gains are all about. It's a plot that represents your sensitivity versus support and it's used very nicely in direct marketing campaigns. So the next important question becomes uh, what will be the optimal gains? I mean what would be the best gains that you can achieve? In order to answer that question uh, we need to introduce the concept of the base rate. And the base rate represents here is uh, essentially the number of true positives plus false negatives divided by uh, sample size. And again, with respect to our little graph here, if you take true positives and false negatives and divide it with respect to the sample size, what you're basically having here is that this is the percentage of responders out there in the population. So going back to our direct mail example, if you, tar you expect to have the default rate of 1% responders, then your base rate will become 1%. Now, it can be now shown mathematically, and it's a good exercise if you just think about it and, and see what happens. Now, it can be shown that uh, if you plot your base rate over here, let's say 1% or 5%, 10%, whatever, the percent of responders out there in the population. And again, I'm plotting support versus sensitivity. Now, we know that in the worst case scenario, our gains curve has this 45 degree line. Uh, in the best case scenario, you will get a model that will allow you to identify all of the responders before everyone else uh, gets into the targeted uh, segment. So in other words, in the ideal case, when you have a model that works perfect, you will get a situation that once you have your data set and you score it uh, by a sign score, then all of the pluses will be above all of the minuses. Now, and if you look at that data set like that and think what's going to happen, what you will find out is that in this case, the gains curve will essentially look like this. So if this is my base rate, then the gains, gains curve will go straight into here and then it will flatten out. 
And as you can see, unlike ROC curve, which would occupy the entire square, in the case of the gains curve, the best gains that you can get is always controlled by the base rate, which means if you have a population where the base rate is very high, let's say here, uh, something like this, say very high base rate, then your optimal gains curve will be actually very close to the 45 degree line. And that's one of the inconveniences that you should always remember about the gains curve. And of course, the actual gains curve will be squished somewhere in between, and that's the interpretation that we have here. Okay, having introduced gains, now we can also quickly cover the concept of lift. And again, once you understand gains curve, and uh, here we show the gains curve as this. So it's support versus sensitivity. Now, on the other hand, if you take support versus sensitivity divided by support, you'll get a lift curve. Now, what's sensitivity divided by support? Well, let's say, again, going back to my example of 20% population targeted. Uh, and if in this case, according to my model, I'm getting 40% of the group of, in, uh, of the group of interest actually captured. So in this case, lift becomes 40% divided by 20%, and it gives me 2.0. So in other words, the lift will be the ratio of the point, in, uh, that sensitivity of the point on the gains curve divided by basically the sensitivity of the, of the model that used random sampling. And that's an important thing to understand. So at this point, we introduced, again, we looked at our actual predicted kind of uh, the typical scenario here. We looked at the sensitivity. We introduced the concept of support. So then the gains curve on the horizontal axis, you're looking at the support. And the base rate is important because it kind of uh, sets the limit on the optimal gains curve that you'll see here. Uh, at minor observation, another interesting observation here is that uh, it turns out that gains curves and ROC curves are related to each other. And the nature of that relationship can be expressed according to this formula here. As it turns out, on the ROC curve, the vertical axis is the same. You're still plotting sensitivity. But the, on the horizontal axis in the ROC curve, you, in this configuration of ROC curve, you would plot 1 minus specificity. And if you do a little bit of algebra, a little bit of manipulation there, what you will discover is that 1 minus specificity is going to be this formula here. And again, it's a good exercise to play around with this formula, and then eventually you can convince yourself that this term uh, over here is always less than this term. It's always less than that term. So in other words, when you have a gains curve, the gains curve can always be converted into an ROC curve by essentially stretching it to the left. And there is a good intuition for it because ROC curve can fill up the entire square here. And uh, that kind of uh, starting to make sense. And also notice that in this formula here, uh, let me do a little bit of cleanup. Okay, so in this formula here, in this formula here, you're taking the support and you're subtracting this and then you're also dividing by this. Now, if your base rate is very small, let's say 0.01, that's 1%, or even smaller, then approximately this term is close to 0 and this term is close to 1. So the end result will be pretty much your gains curve. And as you can see, the smaller the base rate, the closer the gains curve going to resemble out of C curve. Of course, once you switch to the opposite uh, class, when you have a very large base rate, then your gains curve is going to generate the pretty much 45 degree line. So at this point, hopefully, you get some understanding of what gains are all about. And again, they, they arise in the direct marketing campaigns and when we are interested in uh, maximizing or improving the lift 
uh, the percent of targeted group captured for the specific campaign. And it can all be formalized by introducing these concepts of support, sensitivity, and a few other considerations. And we also learned that there is an interesting way to connect gains with an ROC. Now, unlike area under ROC curve, there is really no need to talk about area under gains curve because as we have seen, the optimal gains curve I mean, the best gains curve always depends on your base rate, and therefore, if I tell you that I've got a Gary under gains curve of 0.7, it's really meaningless. It has no point of reference. Whereas when I would tell you that I've got an ROC area of a 0.7, that already tells me something because I know ROC is always between 0.5 and 1.0. Okay, so hopefully at this point. Uh, We've covered a lot of stuff. This is the end of games. Unfortunately, this is not yet the end of uh, binary classification cost function. In the next video, we are going to talk about yet another way to evaluate the performance of binary classification models.